If you have a Bible, if you'd open to Romans chapter 5, I am so excited to share with you uh, part 2 of Stepping Into Victory. Um, By the way, uh, our fast, there's a slide, thank you so much, our fast ends next Sunday, as you know. We've been fasting, if you're visiting or you haven't been a part of this, we've been fasting from sweets, breads, and alcohol. I know some of you have made, I've made a couple of exceptions myself, but for the most part, been following that fast, which is awesome. And asking God for intimacy and freedom and breakthrough. And I want to just tell you, beloved, that I'm hearing reports that it's happening. There are good things happening, which is awesome. And I, for one, have been experiencing the power of prayer from this house. Like, I feel like Cheryl and I are walking in a blessing because people are praying. It's very, very powerful. In other words, God's answering our prayers. Amen. How many of you would say you're experiencing that same blessing that I am? Okay, that's, that's a goodly amount. The rest of you who are not, we're praying that you will. We're praying that you will experience that. But uh, we end next Sunday at 1 o'clock at the end of the second service and uh, going to the baptism. I understand there's going to be hot dogs and cake. That sounds disgusting, but I'm probably going to eat them both. And... Uh, and, uh, and then what we want to do, just so you know, uh, and I've asked Sarah to help me with this because I'm going to have Sarah do like prayer coordinating and prayer, help, help me with direction of prayer. Uh, we're going to have continued daily prayer meetings from 7 to 8. So next Sunday is our last prayer meeting because of the fast. And then Monday, we're going to try to go through the end of the year. In order to do that, what we need is five people to commit each day so we have a team, so we know if no one else shows up, there's going to be five. Obviously, if the five have an emergency, get sick, go to town, that happens. But for the most part, if you commit, you're going to be there. And so we're going to look for five people each day, on a, five people on a Monday, on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, to commit to coming to the resource room from 7 to 8 and praying together. Preferably 5 to 7 would be awesome, but 7 o'clock's good. And 7 to 8 to pray together and then everyone else is welcome to be committed. We can have more than five, okay? We're just asking for a minimum of five. If you add up, if you're good at math, you know that five times seven is 35. So we're talking about, about 10% of our church population, really. It's not a ton of people that we're asking to commit. And we want to steward everyday prayer meetings the rest of the year, all right? So we really feel like we're meant to continue this. So if you would like to be a part of that, we're going to have a sign up next week, uh, but Please be thinking and praying about that, and um, we want to build teams. We'll, ha- we'll have a, a prayer leader for each day, and then we want to have teams. Eventually, we want to start adding live worship where we can, those that have, have the energy and time to do that. We're going to add live worship. If not, we'll do what we've been doing, which is music via CD. And, uh, but anyway, it's been really awesome. I was just at the prayer meeting yesterday, and it was fantastic. It's really good. So, uh, and Cheryl's been telling me, I think, Cheryl, you do, t- is it Wednesday. Cheryl does Wednesday. I usually do Saturday. Thanks, Josh, for covering me the last two Saturdays. But it's been awesome. It's been really good. Those of you that haven't been, uh, there's no guilt, no shame. We encourage you to jump on board. But we've had a great time, and it's been amazing. We've had at least, I'd say we've had between 5 and 25 people praying every single day for the last 42 or 3 days, which is amazing. That's good. And so we want to just continue that. And so we're looking to build teams. So would you pray about being on a team? You know, you nine o'clockers, I want to encourage you to drink your caffeine or whatever you need. Five-hour energy, Holy Spirit, quiet time. You can always just get up in the morning, spend time with Jesus. You come so excited. Come on now. This is awesome. All right. Um, Yeah. So, supernatural steps. Yeah, let me just get back on that. So, We've been talking about supernatural steps, and the idea is that God wants us to partner with him for advancement. So what are the spiritual, practical steps we can take? You know, we do our part, God does his part. We do our part, God does his part. And together, we see advancement. There's an interesting passage of scripture in 1 Timothy 4. Paul says to Timothy, his son, who was a little timid, he was a little intimidated, he had some issues, he got sick a little bit. He had, he's a lot like the modern-day American, actually, Timothy was. And Paul told him, he said, look, I want, son, I want you to be intense. I want you to be absorbed in the things that you're going after because you're, so your progress will be evident to all. So it's in a fascinating scripture. He's saying, I want you to make progress, and I want it to be so evident that people around you can go, you're making progress. And that's actually true for all of us. The Lord wants all of us to have the kind of life 
where when other people look at us, they go, you're making progress. Something's different about you. You smell a little bit more like Jesus. There's something about you. You seem like you got a little more glory on you. What's going on with you? Amen? Amen. That's where we want to go, and that's where God wants us to go. So that's why we're talking about supernatural steps. And uh, we've talked about several supernatural steps. We started out with stepping into prayer and fasting. It's interesting. I, I love the tribe, the, the sort of tribe I'm in, which is, I don't know what to call it, but it's called Revival Alliance anyway. It's sort of a, it's sort of a Holy Spirit river, Father loves you, my destiny's important uh, tribe mixed with running to the, into the darkest places of the earth. And it's interesting little tribe. So some parts of our tribe are sort of like, you know, uh, there's nobody in our tribe that's legalistic, I would say, about prayer and fasting. But there are some parts of our tribe that believe in prayer and fasting because they understand that it's a way to display our hunger for God and to uh, sometimes, you know, Jesus said, these things do not come out but by prayer and fasting. But there's other parts of our tribe that make fun of prayer and fasting. It's very interesting. They'll sort of make fun of it and talk about why we don't need it. And, and so uh, I know that sounds crazy, but there's a little bit of controversy right now about prayer and fasting. So... Uh, if you have that in you, I want to encourage you to go back and hear the messages on stepping into prayer and fasting. I think they'll help you. Uh, because as you, just so you know, in this house, we don't pray and fast from a legalistic place. We pray and fast because we're absolutely in love with Jesus. We're hungry and we want more. We absolutely believe in the provision of Jesus on the cross. We're not praying and fasting to get him to do more. He's already done everything. But we're praying and fasting because we want more of what he's already provided. Amen? And so we step into that, and there's something about hunger and thirst that he loves. He absolutely loves. You know, I love what Mary said when, she, uh, when the angel came to her and said, you're going you're gonna to birth uh, Jesus, the Son of God. Uh, she said, my soul, remember she said, my soul magnifies the Lord. She just began to worship God, and she, she made this statement. She said, she said, the hungry you fill with good things, but the rich you send away empty-handed. And that wasn't just talking about money saying that the people that realize that they need, Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit. That word poor means bankrupt. It's where you realize on your own you got nothing. Blessed are the people that are in touch with their own bankruptcy. Why? Because not so they'll stay bankrupt and impoverished and slaves, to, but so that they will get filled. Theirs is the kingdom. They get everything. They inherit everything. Why? Because they got in touch with their need. And so it's very important. So we've been talking about stepping into prayer and fasting. We talked about stepping into intimacy with God, into the presence of God. Uh, we talked about um, stepping into, what else do we talk about? Oh, stepping into, um, I have it in my notes. Let's see here. Oh, the fruit of mess. We talked about stepping into the reality that sometimes it gets messy when you go after God. And then we've been talking about the stepping into victory. And my son-in-law, Josh, Hit a home run, I heard, yeah? Let's give him a hand. Good job, Joshy. And so it's my joy to be part two. I'm the follow-up to his message on, uh, on David, uh, but I'm not going to talk about David. I just want to talk to you again about stepping into victory from a little different standpoint today. We're going to look at several scriptures, but uh, I want to start with Romans 5. And if you have a Bible, uh, we're going to hold it up in just a second. But let me just, before I even hold up my Bible, let me just say this. I personally love the fight. I love it. I didn't used to love it. I actually was dismayed when I found out there was a fight. I'm all, dang it. I thought we got saved and it was all taken care of. Why do we have to fight, you know? And, uh, but I've, I've come to learn to love the fight. I've embraced the, the reality that life is a fight. I don't mean by that, I'm not taking anything away from what Jesus has accomplished. It's sort of what I've talked to you about. He promised the promised land and then he made us fight for it. So we're, that's what I mean by the fight. Not the fight to get God to do something or twist God's arm. That's not the fight we're talking about. But the fight to partner with God for what's already ours. We step into what he's already purchased. And uh, I've learned to embrace the fight. I remember um, when I was younger, I got into a couple of fights with some guys. Uh, and I always won, by the way. Actually, I did lose one fight. That was embarrassing. Yeah. But I won most of them. And then when I got a little older, I joined the San Luis Boxing Club because my dad and I used to watch boxing. That was super fun for me. I remember I got my first black eye and I showed my dad. I was so excited about that. And then, uh, and then in my, when I became a pastor, I decided to take up Kenpo Karate. So then I was, I was working out at night and, you know, I would, I would pray for people. And if they didn't get healed, I'd kick them right in the stomach. And <laughs> Just kidding. I didn't do that. You guys all right? Everybody all right? Everybody alive? Check your pulse. Just check your pulse. Am I here? Yeah, I'm here. All right, good. 
Well, I'm having a good time anyway, so. And, and, then, uh, and then, so then that, that stopped for a while, uh, let's see, about, uh, oh, 20 years, and tw- a little over 20 years. And then, <clears throat> so lately, the last five, six months, I've been doing uh, MMA training where I'm, you know, mostly conditioning, actually. I'm doing it for conditioning purposes, just so you know. I'm not trying to hurt anyone. God, you know, we're people of peace. And, uh, but it's really fun to be with vicious people because it reminds you that we're in a fight. We are in a fight. And uh, the, the enemy would love nothing more than to take people on the central coast of California and throw, you know, play a violin and give them a little Chardonnay and just say, hey, there's no fight. Don't, don't worry about it, sweetie. I'm going to beat the snot out of you all day and all night, but I'm going to convince you there is no fight. So you'll never fight back. You'll just get pummeled and you'll say, oh, well, the sun's out. And you'll never reach your destiny, but I'm good with that. I'll pummel you just enough that you never reach your destiny, but not so much that you actually suspect it's me. So that's going on right now. And there's a lot of people that don't, they've lost the reality that there is a fight, but there is a fight. And we need to step into victory because otherwise you lose. And if you lose, the price is extremely high. It's not like, oh, bummer, I lost, but I still walked in my destiny and I still, no. Actually, you lost your destiny. Some people don't go to heaven because they lost the fight. It's a big deal. We're not talking about some small thing here. We're talking about life and death. We're talking about purpose and shipwreck. We're talking about big stuff here. And so f- learning to fight and learning how to win is extremely important. So of all the stepping into's, this might be the most important because we've got to learn to step into victory. And so I'm really glad that Josh listened to me and talked about this topic because that's why I wanted to talk about Josh. It's that important. It's so important that we talk about this because much of the church is getting beat up right now and I'm tired of it. I'm tired of the church losing. I want the church to win because Jesus wants us to win. Jesus said it himself, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I've come that you might have, the Greek word is super abundant life. I want you to win. I want you to have such a life that you're like, you're vibrating with joy like, oh, I love my life. That's how he wants us to live. Not that we don't go through hard times. We do. We have struggles in our marriages. Why? Because it's two people trying to learn to become one. It's a challenge, man. It's hard. But we got to win. So winning doesn't mean it's not hard. Winning means that it's hard and you win. You fight through and you learn how to find gain in the pain. You learn how to get to the other side of the mountain. I'm trying, Curtis. I am trying, man. Just reach your hand out. Come on. I need a little Joseph Garlington on me right now. Here we go. Oh, little T.D. Jakes. Help me, Lord. Teach me how to preach. I want to learn how to preach before I go to heaven. I'm trying to learn how. I am. So anyway, if you have a Bible, if you just hold it. And by the way, we're not just fighting for ourselves, guys. We're fighting for others. We're fighting for our families. I mean, how many of you, here's what happens. Our families get the snot beat out of them, and we notice after the fact. We're living life, kind of bopping along, and our, all of a sudden, one of our kids is like in Satan's camp, just getting the crap beat out of him, and all, we're like, well, this is a bummer. And a year or two years later, we start fighting, and we should have started fighting a year or two years earlier, before they ever, but we're just not on, we're not on duty. We're like, oh no, everything's good, life's good, are you good, I'm good, everybody's good. Listen, kids, you shouldn't probably listen to that music, you know, it's probably not that good for you, but it's okay, I don't want to come across like a controlling strict parent, so hey, whatever you want to do is cool with me, just, you know, just let's be friends, you know. And So we do all this stuff, and our kids are like getting ripped off because we're not on watch as watchmen. We're not standing and saying, no, I'm not going to lose you. I will not lose you. And so many parents have had to learn this the hard way. You know, I've had to learn. I I did not have any idea, even though I I was in this culture when I was a teenager, I thought there's no way that my kids were doing some of the things they were doing until after the fact. And when I found out, oh man, Cheryl and I released a roar. We instituted something called Trust Bucks. We we had our kids, we 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 drove them to school and to pick them up for three months every single day and went there at lunch and had lunch with them Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We fought for them, man. We just fought for them. We prayed with them. We gave them, we did this thing called trust bucks where they had to redevelop trust in the family. I mean, it was like, it was a war. And we're winning. But there were times where we were losing. You know, there was times where it was just blood and sweat and tears. 
And I just want to say to you guys that we got to learn how to fight because people's lives are, not just your life, but the lives around you are at stake. And you are your brother's keeper, you know. You are. You, you are. you are going to give an account for the people around you. You are not allowed to live a selfish life. You can't call yourself Christian and live a self, self-absorbed life. That's not allowed. That's, you're, in, you're out of bounds when you do that. We have, to, we have to live this life. Jesus said, if you want to find your life, go ahead and let, give it away. Lay your life down. As you do that, life will pour into you. If you become this person that you're about yourself, you will lose your life. We've got to fight for each other. Husbands, you've got to fight for your wife. Wives, you've got to fight for your husbands. Parents, you've got to fight for your kids. Kids, you've got to fight for your parents. Families have to fight for one another. Churches have to fight for each other, not against other churches, but against a common enemy. It's okay to have family identity. That's not the problem. The problem is we're not fighting the right enemy. So let's hold up our Bibles. I'm going to go. <laughs> I'm so sorry. My intros take forever. So then we, okay, well, they're just going to have to be what it is. So uh, here we go. You guys ready? Let's go to the next slide, please. Let's say this together. Glorious God, nothing is impossible with you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And I believe that 2016 is my best year ever. By your grace, I will advance by taking practical, supernatural steps according to your word and by your spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I want to read Romans 5, verses 6 through 17, okay? This is an awesome, there's so many good passages of scripture that talk about victory, but this is one of them. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even though those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, uh, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For if by the transgression of the one the many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. Your head might be spinning right now. That's okay. This is the key verse right here. For if by the transgression of the one, that's Adam, death reigned through the one, that's Adam, much more those who receive what? The abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. I want to just make three points quickly. I've only got a little bit of time, but the first one is that there is provision for total victory. There is provision for total victory. That means that you can have complete 100% victory in your life. You don't have to settle for partial victory. You don't have to have some victory. You don't have to have like 80% and be like, hey, that's a B minus, I'll take it. You don't, you, you may land there, but you don't have to live there. You can live at 100% if you want to. The 100% is for those who want it, but it's available. It's been provided for. Now, how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand. This is just a rhetorical question. But how many of you are tired of getting beat up in life? How many people are tired of losing? You know? We were born to fight, but we were not born to lose. Failure is an event, but it's not a person. God's people are not failures. You are not a failure. You may fail. In fact, the Bible even says it like this, though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. 
Still a righteous man, the one that fell seven times. Not a failure, a righteous man. Identity is first, always in the Lord. You're a righteous man, but you fell seven times. You got a pattern in your life. It needs to change. What does it say in Galatians 6 1? Let those who are spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, being careful and not arrogant because we would fall into temptation too. Let's help each other out of the patterns of our lives, but let's never challenge the identity. You're not a failure, you're a righteous one, and you're better than this. We just had this talk with someone. You're better than this. What does that mean? That means your identity is secure. You're not acting like who you are. Let's act like who you are. Not your identity just changed. You're now a failure. Nope. You failed. You failed. You failed. But you're not a failure. You're better than this because you're a champion. Let's act like a champion. And that identity issue begins to, ha- begins to seep into us until we go, wait a second, I am a champion. And then we begin like the sleeping giant to shake off the enemy and the ropes on our lives, we say, I'm not putting up with this anymore. I'm a champion. And that's not arrogance. That's confidence. And that's how we should live. Because unless you live like that, you won't live in victory. Verse 6 through 8, when did Christ die for us? When we were helpless. Now that ought to give you comfort. He died at your most weak, vulnerable state when you could bring nothing to the table. You brought nothing I know some of you were raised in a Christian home. You're like, hey, wait a second, I brought something. No, you didn't. You didn't bring anything. It doesn't mean you're a bad person, but you didn't bring it. You don't, you're not good enough to pay for your own sin. No matter how much you've prayed in your life or how much you've gone to church since you were five years old, you're not good enough to pay for your own sin. You were helpless when it comes to being right before God. You might be better than a couple of people around you, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about actually redeeming your own life. You can't redeem your own life. Because you're coming to a perfect God who's never sinned. That means one sin casts you out of his presence. How are you going to get back into his presence? You can't. Because the Bible says there's nobody who does good and never sins. There's not one person from Billy Graham on down. There's nobody that's just never made a mistake, never sinned, or doesn't still make mistakes. There's nobody like that. So we're going to mess it up if it's up to us. While we were helpless, Christ died for us. He died in our weakest state when we got nothing. And you know what we do? We compare ourselves to one another and we go, well, I'm I'm better than that person. That leads to pride. And we start to think that we brought salvation on ourselves. Or we look at other people and go, I'm not as good as that person. That brings insecurity and we go off into a ditch and we feel sorry for ourselves and we sin some more. Neither one is the solution. We're all helpless. It's the great leveler. While we were helpless, the we is all of humanity. There's nobody excluded from the we. While we were helpless, Christ died for us. When did he die for us? When we were helpless, when we couldn't do a thing to fix ourselves or to save ourselves, that's when he died for us. That ought to give us hope because if you find yourself a bit helpless today, guess what? You're no more helpless than you were when Christ died for you. We're helpless, but we're not hopeless. We're helpless. We can't help ourselves. That's religion, self-help teaching is always trying to get you to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. There is a time, of course, to think positively and to have positive confessions and all that stuff. I'm not saying that we don't help ourselves. There is a thing to do, but that's not the foundation of our lives. You're not just going to pull yourself up. I've seen people who have said, been addicted in addiction and said to themselves, well, I'm going to just pull myself up. But you know what? Sometimes you just need to realize that you're helpless. In fact, it really, if you just followed sort of the, you know, the steps, the 12 steps or whatever it's called, you got to come to a place where you just go, I'm helpless. I'm at the bottom here and I need some help. And you have to admit your stuff, right? That brokenness, that place of humility and brokenness is the starting place. It takes sometimes, God, 20 years to get somebody to admit that they need help. 30 years, 40 years. Could you imagine spending 40 years of your life being too proud to say, I'm helpless? What if we just said it today and got it over with? What if we just got past ourselves and said, I can't do this, man. This is way too hard. You know what? It cannot be religion. It cannot be how much you've prayed, how much you've fasted, how much you've done this. It can't be that because you'll never do enough. You always can do more. And there'll always be a voice that will tell you, I know, I know you pray, but you know, you, David Hogan reads 18 chapters a day and you like read two. I know you want to raise the dead. When are you going to start reading 18? See, you'll always hear that voice just egging you on, just going, oh God, that's right. You'll live like a failure till you meet that one. And then somebody else is going to come along and give you a, a testimony. You're like, oh my God, that's right, yeah. And you just never, it'll be slavish. And I'm not saying we shouldn't read the Bible or pray. That's not my point. My point is is that you have to realize that you will never get there by what you do. 
that you're helpless. That's the starting place. We're helpless. That's a message in itself. I should just stop and camp on that. And then how do we get justified? By his blood. That's another thing that has nothing to do with you. He died when we were helpless, and his blood justifies us, and his blood has, he shed his own blood when you weren't even there. You had nothing to do with, I mean, we, we crucified him, of course, we know all that, but I'm talking about, in reality, you had nothing to do with when he died, and you had nothing to do with, his blood is pure and has the power, one drop cleanses us from all sin, and that's what justifies us. It's not, we don't get justified by putting on a happy face and saying, I'm good. We don't get justified by saying, hey, you know what? I haven't looked at porn for the last three weeks. I'm doing good. That's not what justifies us. What justifies us is his blood, only his blood. His blood is our only hope. If we don't have his blood, we got nothing. You got nothing without his blood. It takes his blood to cleanse you from your sin and from my sin. His blood will do it. His blood will free us. Not your track record. His blood. Come on. His blood. When did we get reconciled? When we were God's enemies. When we were fighting against him. When we were going against his purposes. You're like, I am not God's enemy. Oh, you've been God's enemy. Surely you have. Religion is God's enemy. If you've ever been religious, you've been his enemy. How do we get reconciled to God? Through the death of his son, Jesus Christ. The father was completely satisfied by the death of his son. He, Jesus was the scapegoat. He was the one that the father put all the sin of the world, you know, the scapegoat in the Old Testament. They would put all the sins, they would lay hands symbolically on this goat, and they'd send the goat out of town and say, you're, you're out, you're, you're done, you're the scapegoat. All the sin goes on you, and you get out, and you're done. We... We don't have any sin anymore because it's on you, the goat. And Jesus became the scapegoat. He wasn't a goat. He's a sheep. You know, he, became, he was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. And all the sin of humanity was put on him. And the father looked at that sacrifice and said, I am completely satisfied. All the sin of humanity, past, present, future, we're talking about billions upon billions and trillions of sins. All those sins were placed on the spotless, perfect, beautiful lamb of God, and the father said, I am satisfied by that. I will now justify people just as if they'd never sinned. I will declare them completely clean and completely righteous before me. Did they have to do anything? No, because there's not a thing they can do. They're helpless. They're my enemies. And I'm going to do it all in advance. I'm going to do it when they haven't even tried. I'm going to pay for everything when they haven't done one thing to save themselves so that they, have, they don't ever get confused that it's not about them, it's about me. And what happens as we become Christians, we start to put confidence in our own selves. That's what happened in Galatians. Paul said to the Galatians, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect in the law? Now why are you measuring yourself by some sort of standard in your quiet time and your this and your that, thinking that that's what justifies you? Oh, I can't come before God today. I didn't spend any time with him. You need to spend time with him, but you can certainly come before God because coming before God is not based on your quiet time. Otherwise, you're a legalist. You say, but that doesn't seem right. I'll take, I'll take his grace for granted. No, no, you'll do just the opposite. His kindness will lead you to repentance. How did things get so messed up? It started with Adam, right? Adam, through the one man, sin entered the world. But the Bible says it wasn't just that. Some people say, well, that's not fair. It's not just that Adam sinned. It's that Adam sinned and then we all sinned. That's what the scripture just said. Adam sinned and we sinned. So believe me, we're all guilty. And the law, what did the law do? The law was like a yellow highlighter. The, law just, the law's job was to highlight your sin. It wasn't to make, make you ashamed. It was to help you see it. So what ha the Bible says that when the law wasn't in effect, People were still sinning, they just weren't as aware of it. That's what, that's what that we, passage we just read said. But when the law came along, it said, don't commit adultery. Oh, I sinned, I just committed adultery. So there was, con there was conviction of sin before the law and people were sinning, but when the law came, it became super clear how many times people were sinning, which is why the law was so exhausting, which is per why the purpose of the law was to make us want a savior, to go, we are helpless only the most religious among them could keep the law, and they're called Pharisees. 
The Pharisees were the top dogs. They had the most self-will. They were generally the meanest because they were the strong ones. And the strong ones are always the mean ones in religion. They're always the ones that think it's about them. So they're like, hey, they're the ones that will preach the seminars on how to be, put yourself together, on how to do a diet, exercise, nutrition, your quiet time. They, they've got, they, think that, they think that they're better than other people because of what they do, when actually they're not because they haven't done a single thing to earn anything from God. They're supposed to be doing those things out of gratitude, working out their salvation with fear and trembling, but instead they thought it merited them something before God. So they become the ones we put on the platform so that we can all feel bad and come under law and go, that, what was the list? They gave me 17 lists of 14 things to do, 17 times 14. Okay, if I can do those things, that's, how many things? That's, that's a 200. And, yeah, if I could do those things, I can, I can be right before God. It may take me seven to 12 years, but maybe in year eight, I can be right before. That's, that's how we live. Instead of just stopping and going, I got nothing. And I need you, God. And I, there's not enough, I'm not, I'm not excusing myself from any behavior, but right now there's not a single thing I can do to justify coming before you. So what if I just trust in your provision? What if I just acknowledge, Jesus, you paid it all? What if I step into the, your presence through the veil of your flesh, that new and living way, I just come in? Wow. Wow, I didn't deserve that. It's like, yeah, I know. Not only did you not deserve it, but I actually love you. I'm not mad at you. That doesn't seem right, God. It seems like you would let me in and then make me feel bad for a few years. Nope. I'm actually taking away all your guilt and shame. Are you serious? You're not going to condemn me? Nope. I want you to come in. Well, what do I do now? Well, let's walk together. But, yeah, walk with me the same way you got in. The way in is the way on. Having begun in the Spirit, be made perfect in the Spirit. Don't be made perfect in the flesh. Don't set up a law system now. Do it, do it in relationship with me. Let everything be in relationship with me. I provided for everything. Let's do this together. When you slip up, I'll hold your hand. Don't you worry. Well, don't, when I slip up, don't I get separated from you? Nope. You've been grafted in. You're with me. We're one now. You're united with Christ. You're a different person. You're in the family. You belong to me. I'm not going to kick you out. I'm not going to drop kick you every time you make a mistake. How come we're not preaching the gospel in the church? So verses 12 through 17, I'm not anywhere, cl- I haven't even started my second point, for goodness sakes. Ah! <laughs> verses 12 through 17 clearly delineate two paths. I just want to sort of, I'll have to finish this and finish this later, but there are four steps to path one, and there are four, or four parts to path one and four parts to path two. Here's the path one. We sin which leads to judgment. God looks at our sin and judges us as having sinned, which leads to condemnation. The wages of sin, there's a a penalty, there's a cost. It costs something. We are condemned. Yep, you've sinned. That's condemnation. You've sinned, which leads to death. The wages of sin is death. The end result of sin, if it's not dealt with, it goes sin, judgment, condemnation, death. That's what verses 12 through 17 say. That is the pattern of sin. We sin, God looks at it and says, yep, you've sinned, that's judgment, a judgment call. Did you sin or not sin? Are you guilty or innocent? You're guilty. That's judgment. That's what judgment means. Judge, jury, you're guilty of sinning. That judgment leads to a consequence, which is condemnation. You are hereby condemned to a prison sentence, which then leads to death. You will die. And if you don't deal with it, you'll be separated from me for eternity. That's not a good deal. There's nothing about that that's a good deal. The sin part's not good, the judgment part's not good, the condemnation part's not good, and the death part is not good. Here's the opposite. The abundance of God's grace. It starts with grace. Where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Oh, what is grace? It's the undeserved, unmerited, unearned favor, blessing, goodness, fire, glory, supply of God to unworthy people. And it's not a little bit, it's an abundance. The abundance is mentioned three times, four times in Scripture. The abundance of grace leads to what's called the free gift of righteousness. That grace, which is I'm going to give you something you don't deserve, and it's going to be, I'm going to, ta-da, 
you're righteous. My son paid it all. Of course, over the years, I want you to, as your love deepens, I want you to value and appreciate, but you can't value fully right now what my son did for you. It's okay. You just, you're just new to this thing. But over time, as you have an understanding, your love for what my son accomplished for you is going to grow. But right now, it's, it's rather small, but that's okay. I don't expect you to understand this fully yet. But I want you to know, what my son did for you has resulted in you being made completely righteous. You are completely righteous now. It's a free gift. I'm handing it to you. You're righteous. Being righteous means that we're fully justified. Justified as, means just as if I'd never sinned. There's not one thing the enemy or God holds against us. All of our sins have been removed as far as the east is from the west. It's been cast in the sea of forgetfulness, and we are justified. That means we get to stand before God as righteous as his son, Jesus Christ, which is absolutely a ridiculous thought. Just think about that. Jesus, the, at the right hand of the Father, there's nothing between the Father and the Son. Jesus never sinned. There's no, the Father isn't looking at the Son with any disparagement, any kind of, oh, yeah, you're here by the skin of your teeth. He's like, no, that's my Son in whom I'm well pleased. I love him. There's nothing between him. I just, I, I'm in love with him. He's, we're one. This, that's how we are with the Father. That's crazy to think about, but we are fully justified because of the free gift of night, righteousness which came out of the abundance of God's grace. The grace of God which says, I want to give you something. I want to just, I'm so full of love. I want to give you gifts you don't deserve. My son paid for them all. I'll just give you some goodies. Here's the biggest one. I'm going to give, I'm going to give you righteousness. Not self-righteousness. Righteousness. True righteousness. And because of that, you've been fully justified. You're justified. And then what does it say? Now we reign in life. We have victory. The path to victory. So many people are trying to find victory over here. Sin, let's see, where's victory? Is it between sin and uh, judgment? Is it between judgment and condemnation? Is it between condemnation and death? Oh, the, the, where's the victory? Try harder. That's the victory here. Try harder. Try harder. Get yourself together. Come on. Get on an eraser. Hide it. Pretend. Lie. Cover. Fig leaves. That's, that's the victory here. It's, it's, it's take care of your stuff because you're in the wrong pathway. There's no victory here, but we keep trying to find victory here. That's what, it, that's what religion does. The devil's trying to keep the church over here between sin, judgment, condemnation, and death. Between sin and judgment, we're trying to plead, oh, could, judge, could we please say I'm not guilty? Could I have, a, could I have one more pardon, please? Could I, you know, we're, we're like standing before a judge who's fully just and going, nope, guilty every time. You're always guilty, 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 guilty. Like, you're so mean. And we're talking to God as though he's over here when he's actually over here. This is the devil's path. He created this whole thing. Sin, remember before Satan, there was no sin. Who came to Adam in the garden and Eve? The devil, the serpent, right? Sin, which leads to judgment, which leads to condemnation, which leads to death. And where the church is hanging out over here trying to find their way back to God, there's no way back. You can't find your way back to God. There's nothing you can do to get out of this pattern. You've got to start with the abundance of grace. So am I going to turn my face towards sin or towards the abundance of grace? What if you wake up and you've sinned in the first two seconds of the day? Stop, turn your face towards grace. Where sin abounded, grace much more abounded. Oh, wow, I don't need to keep sinning because there's grace. Oh, I don't deserve it, I know, but it's grace, that's what it is. It's the, it's the sweet kiss of God that grabs you by the cheeks and said, let's turn your eyes away from sin right now, let's look at me. You can do this, come on, I love you. I care about you, I've made provision for you. Will you step over here into the free gift of righteousness? It takes us a minute to even wrap our heads around that. Free, free gift of righteousness? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm going I'm to declare you. I'm not just going to label you a gross person righteous, put righteousness on your forehead, and you're disgusting to me. I'm actually going to impute righteousness to you, which means you're going to become righteous. You're not just going to be labeled right. I'm not going to get out a label maker and stick righteous on your forehead. I'm actually going to make you righteous. Did you even catch that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change your constitution. You're going to be fully righteous before me, justified as though you'd never sinned, walking as a son, as a daughter, completely free, no guilt, no shame, no condemnation. That doesn't mean you don't care about sin. That's not the point. The point is you're living in a different world now. You're living in God's world. I'm justified before God. 
Now that doesn't make me go, see, people think, well, if you tell people they're justified, they're going to go on and go sin. Why? I'm in the wrong, I'm not even in the sin camp. I'm not anywhere near sin right now. I'm way over here in the justified camp. I'm not going to run over there now. That's stupid. That sounds terrible. It's only you want to sin more when you're over here because you feel bad. And you're like, ah, might as well sin some more. It's who I am. You start to take on the identity of a sinner. You start to take on the pattern of a sinner. You start to take on defeat as a sinner. And you start to live like a sinner, which is what not what God said. He said, start with grace. Start over here with the abundance of grace. And then step into the free gift of righteousness. And you are justified and understand what that means. And you're going to reign in life from a whole different identity place, a whole different pattern of life. Reign, not just get by, not strive or survive, but thrive. You're going to actually be a victor, not a victim. You're going to reign in life. You're going to rule over your enemies. You're going to step on sin. Things that used to hold you are no longer going to hold you. You're going to walk in a new way and a new day. You're going to have, you're going to have joy and fire and no one can stop you. Why? Because you know who you are. You know whose you are. You're fully righteous. You've been justified. You're baptized in grace. You're living in the life of God and you're reigning in life and it's awesome. This, I haven't even got to my message on victory. This is, just, this is just the gospel. This is just like church 101. Like who's been bewitching us, church? What have we been believing about the gospel? It's not complicated. Now, will there be people that will hear this message and run off and sin some more? Because like, yeah, God forgives me. Yeah, there will be people like that. They misunderstood the whole thing. That's okay. We'll help them along until they finally get the message like, wait a second. You're better than this. Don't you remember whose you are? You're righteous. You're a child of God. You don't need to walk. That's, a whole, that's for somebody else. That's not for you. You've been fundamentally transformed. Not only forgiven, but you've been made righteous now. What does the Bible say? He who, 1 John 3, 8, he who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. Now that can only mean one of two things. Either practice makes perfect or perfect makes practice. So, Let me just go over it again, and I'll finish with this. He who practices righteousness, she who practices righteousness, is righteous just as he is righteous. So either your practice makes you perfect, which we know that can't be true, or you're perfect, and therefore you're practicing. Ephesians 5.8, you are light in the Lord, now walk as children of the light. God makes a declaration before you're acting like it. You are righteous, now act righteous because you are righteous. Always starts with identity. Always ends in behavior. Hello? This is just the beginning of victory. It's just like, it's, we're at Victory 101, but if we could get this much church, we would be living a much different life. There's so much more for us. There's so much more glory and so much more presence and so much more encounter and so much more fire. We are not meant to live like depressed little kids that are constantly failing. We're meant to live like victors, not victims. We are victorious because of the abundance of grace. If we start with grace, we'll go to the free gift of righteousness, we'll live in justification, and we'll reign in life. We won't see ourselves as sinners who have to sin. We'll be like, no, 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 that was, that was the old me. I'm a new person. And you know what? It doesn't matter how long you've been a Christian. You can be a new person today. You don't have to go, well, I wish I could get born again again. Maybe you do. That's okay. You don't have to wait. You don't have to do that. You can just start today. All you do is step into the abundance of grace. See, it's the same for The way in is the way on. So if you lost your way over here, just step now into the abundance of grace. Go over here to the free gift of righteousness. Step into your justification, which Christ accomplished for you while you were still helpless and a sinner, so you can't do anything about it. Yep, I'm justified. Woo, that's amazing. Let me just trip on that for the next eternity. I'm I'm justified? That's amazing. And so I'm going to reign in life. I'm going to take it by faith. I don't fully feel it yet. I feel like a condemned sinner, but I'm not going to live over there. I'm going to live here. I'm going to put on these shoes until I get used to them. They're going to stop giving me blisters. I'm going to live in these shoes. I'm not going to live in these shoes over here anymore. I'm sick of living like that because that just brings pain and death. This sounds amazing. I, I, I feel awkward in this world, but this is my world. I'm going to learn to live in this world and get comfortable in this world because this is where I belong. So many Christians leave this world because it feels uncomfortable to them because they're not used to living justified. They're not used to living righteous. So they put themselves down and put themselves back over here. And you don't have, God's not doing that to you. 
That's, that's, that's either your head or it's the devil or both, which is why we need victory so we can reign in life. We hear a thought. We get so used to this world. You get so used to the true that you recognize the counterfeit. You get so used to this world that you're like, no, no, that's sin. Uh, that's condemnation. That's judgment. That's death. Nope, I'm not co- going there anymore. I don't want any of that. That stinks. It smells bad. My nose was plugged up for 22 years, but now it's been opened, and I can smell that that is death, and I'm not going near it. I'm going to learn to be comfortable over here because this is my new world, and though it's a little strange and awkward, this is where I belong. It takes a little while to get our heads around this world. It's a crazy world. It's more crazy than this world. This world is predictable. This world is nuts. There's unlimited potential in this world. There's there's unlimited, the sky's the limit. I mean, destiny and glory and calling and impact are all over here. Abundance and joy unspeakable and full of glory are all over here. And it's almost like they're like foreign concepts at first. Like, what? 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 Are you serious, God? Yes, I'm serious. All that's yours and more. Well, really? Yep, that's it. That's the real life I have for you. It takes us a while. Sometimes we run over here because it feels more comfortable. Like, I feel comfortable over here. No, yeah, but don't do that. Sometimes God says, I'm going to have to let you go here for a little while till you learn that this is so disgusting. After you're done vomiting 10 or 20 times, you'll finally go, I'm done with that. I don't want to do that anymore. I'm going to go over here and live over here. Amen? Amen. I just want to pray for you about victory right now. I want to pray for this, just this, I want to pray for the Spirit of God, the Spirit of victory to come upon you. Jeremiah says, the Lord is with me. Jeremiah said this, he said, the Lord is with me like a dread champion. I want to pray for the Spirit of the champion to come upon you. The Spirit of God is a champion. He's a dread champion, which means he puts fear in his enemies. The devil is absolutely afraid of this message. The devil is afraid if you get a hold of the real gospel, the true gospel. He doesn't want you to think these thoughts. He doesn't want you to live over here. He wants to get you to revert over here. But I want to tell you, you don't have to. Just stop and draw a line and say, no, no. Yes, God, no devil. Yes, God, no Satan. Yes, God. And the more you go here, the more you're going to start reigning in life. And you won't need to even worry about the devil because you're going to be reigning You're going to be thinking different thoughts. You're going to be going different places. Offenses come against you. You decide to, you're going to start to get bitter and offended. You're like, nope, 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 that pulls me this. I feel a pull. No, 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 no. Okay, I forgive. I release. I want to stay reigning in life. And we stay in the place of grace and forgiveness. And we get free. We learn to live with an unoffendable heart. And then we just stay. We keep reigning. We learn how to reign more and more. It's what God has for us. It's called the gospel. The gospel. 